story goes that when Anandabindika first met the Buddha, he asked the Buddha who he was. And the Buddha said, an awakened one, which is what Buddha means. And Anandabindika said, did you say an awakened one? He was glad to hear that there was an awakened one in the world. And who knows where he got the idea that this was something special. It may have been something buried from a previous lifetime. But for him it was very good news that there was a Buddha in the world. It gave brightness to life. Because the Buddha does teach the way to put an end to suffering. He, doesn't spend a lot of time focusing on issues that are beside the point. His very first sermon, he went straight to the point. This is going to all be about suffering and the end of suffering. His first noble truth, which is often misrepresented as life is suffering, actually says simply, there is suffering and identifies what it is, what we're doing to cause it. The clinging. Wherever there's clinging, there's suffering. And what causes the clinging, there's craving, which is why we have a path to put an end to craving. And the fact that we have these things, that we know these truths, that's really good news. It's what gives brightness to the world. One of the major misunderstandings about the Buddhist teachings is that they're pessimistic. They see the world in dark terms. Well, the Buddha has his focus on the suffering in the world because that is the big problem. He doesn't deny that there's pleasure to the aggregates, pleasure to the senses. But he pointed out that if you focus on the pleasures, you're going to also be subject to the pains, because they'll keep coming back, coming back. But if you can learn how to focus on the drawbacks of these things, learn how to let go of them, the mind opens to something much bigger and much better. That's where the brightness lies. So the Buddha's approach is strategic. He doesn't say life is suffering, simply there is suffering in life. He doesn't say everything is bad. He just points out that if you stay focused and obsessed with the things that people normally get obsessed about, there is going to be a lot of suffering, but if you learn how to undo that obsession, the mind can open to the deathless, which is something really special. That's where the brightness lies. Years back when John Fuhrman commented on what he owed to John Lee, that was his comment that John Lee had showed him the brightness of life. So what's bright in life? The fact that there's a path. And the path leads to the end of suffering. And the end of suffering is not a blank out or a dull state, or just simply learning how to be equanimous about things. There really is another dimension that the mind can touch. Dimension in which there's an awareness that all the suffering is gone. There's an awareness of freedom. So that's why we're practicing. The path is still open. It's still remembered, and we're still in a position where we can practice it. Now there will come a day in the Buddha forecast where people forget the path. And this happened many times before. He himself compared himself to someone who's gone into the forest and come across an old road. He followed the old road, and he came to a deserted city. The person then goes back to the king and says, there's this beautiful deserted city. If you can clean up the road, clear away the roots and the vines, people will be able to inhabit the city again. So that's what he did. He cleared up the roots and the vines, opened up the road. So the way is still open. We should take advantage of that. It's not like we have a lot of time. 
even a hundred years, is a short life. When you come to the end of your life, it seems like there's nothing left. It's all gone. So you have life and you have the opportunity devoted to the practice. This is where the brightness lies. We get sidetracked by the glamour of other things. Beautiful sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. The desire to be beautiful, the desire to be wealthy, the desire to be powerful. All of these things have a glamour that distracts us. It's like fool's gold. It's shiny, but it's not the real thing. So you have to look a little bit deeper to see behind the shine what is there. You take the body apart and there's really nothing that you want to look at in there. You look at wealth and you see all the problems that wealthy people have. You look at power and everybody's afraid to lose their power and they end up doing all kinds of unskillful things. So the goods of the world are not really all that good. Or as John Lee said, the goodness isn't true and the truth isn't good. But the path to the end of suffering is something true and good. It's a noble truth. When the Buddha used the word noble, he was contrasting it with what he called individual or partial truths. In other words, things that are true for people who only have a partial vision of what life is and what its possibilities are. Noble truths are true all the way, and they're true for everybody. That definition of dharma is what maintains its quality. It means that it not, doesn't mean that things are permanent, maintain their quality permanently, but it does mean that their quality is the same for everybody. The path is true for me. The path is true for you. It's true for everybody if we practice it. It's the truth of the will. In other words, there are certain parts of the path that we have to accept as working hypotheses. I mean, the fact that suffering can be ended. You want to believe that if you want to work with the path. You don't have any empirical evidence. But you can ask yourself, what would life be like if you didn't take this path? Be back in the darkness that Ananda Bindika had lived in before the Buddha came. I mean, he lived a good life. He was a generous person. But until he met the Buddha, there was a sense that something was missing. And what was missing was the way out a way to a genuine happiness. And so you take the truths of the path as your working hypothesis and you do your best to see if it's true. Because the alternative is, is so depressing. I mean, that that's the irony there, people who Look at Buddhism as being pessimistic. You ask, well, what do they have to offer as a path to happiness? And nothing really reliable, nothing really that would measure up anywhere near to what the Buddha has to offer. They're the pessimists. You have to take the good with the bad, they say. You have to put up with this in order to get that. And the Buddha says, okay, there are hardships on the path, but once you get to the end, you're not putting up with anything at all anymore. The mind is totally free, totally relieved of its burdens. There really is a path, and it really is good. But you want to be able to test that for yourself. 
If you don't, it'll always be a question mark. It'll be a question mark that'll be haunting you. As with Anandabindaga, he didn't consciously think about the fact that the world was lacking a Buddha before he met the Buddha, but as soon as he found one, he realized, oh, this is what it's been missing. So don't just lie around and wait until the path is closed when it gets forgotten. It gets buried by what the Buddha called improved dharma. We see this all around us. People saying, well, why don't we change the vinya here? Why don't we change the dharma there and make it nicer? That's what's going to kill the dharma. So while the true dharma is still alive, you take advantage of it. It's still available. It's simply up to you to decide whether it's important enough to focus all your attention here. <laughs>